So what is the concept of a time chain? Everyone knows what a blockchain is. I mean, obviously it's 2020, right? Gosh, I shouldn't do sarcasm. It's not a, it's not a good look for me. All right, so nobody knows what a time chain is, but everyone knows what a blockchain is. Everyone wants to put everything on a blockchain, but really people don't have a, a very good understanding of what blockchains are good for. And I think this time chain idea is a step in the right direction into understanding what the blockchain actually is, why it's trustless. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, the, it, the existing Bitcoin code base that's on GitHub, because it's open source, is actually very complicated. Um, instead, I like to look at the uh, original Bitcoin source code. I think this was like leaked many, many years ago. Um, it's only like a couple of files. So there's a lot of simplicity in the way the original Bitcoin was designed, even though there were vulnerabilities in it. I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a tangent here. All right, I'm going to stay on topic. You'll notice the highlighted portion of this says time chain. Okay, so what that what that means is in the code base and nowhere in the code base, nowhere in the original Bitcoin white paper was there ever any use of the word blockchain, right? The term blockchain was a term that naturally came about as people were grasping with the idea of a decentralized timestamp server because that's what it was called in the original white paper, a decentralized timestamp server. What Satoshi thought of the blockchain was actually more of a time chain. And I'll show you why that term reveals more about what block, the blockchain and what Bitcoin actually is. So a good way to think about the blockchain is, that is, is as a decentralized clock. All a clock is, is a system that is regulated by its internal structure to keep time. Um, by this definition, you know, you're a clock, so it's, it's slightly more complex than that, but there, there are structures that only exist to keep time. Um, those are what we call clocks. This is one of the first clocks, the pendulum. Uh, you'll see here that there was a frequency reference, that's what it's called, and then that frequency was how we measured a unit of time. So when a pendulum would swing, one swing would, would define one second. All right, as we progressed and got even more advanced, I believe the atomic clock, I don't know what year this was actually invented. Um, not, not the point. The point is, is that when you put a certain type of atom through like a microwave, Right, I'm like really butchering the science here. Um, you, essentially, it vibrates at a very standard, predictable rate. So you could measure that rate, and then that further defined a second at a higher degree of accuracy. So the trend here is the more oscillations you can get in the same unit of time, the more accurate of the of measurement you can get of that unit of time. Now, how does the blockchain differ from that? All right, so the blockchain isn't really focused as in a, a, on accuracy. All right, so I don't want to give too much away. I want to unfold this for you in the proper in the proper way. So on the Bitcoin blockchain, one block represents about 10 minutes, meaning that uh, six blocks represents about one hour. What's interesting about this is how the blockchain actually uses what it has internal to itself to regulate this system of keeping time, right? How does the blockchain keep all the blocks coming in 10 minutes? How does the blockchain keep uh, six blocks keeping in about an hour, right? And it's, it's very important that this does happen in a predictable way because the block has the, the purpose of issuing new coins, processing payments for merchants, uh, paying miners for the incentive for them to produce bucks at all. So the, the function of producing blocks is important, but how does it get that in strict time intervals? Uh, you, really what your computer does is it just has a clock in it, right? It just, it connects to some atomic clock. There's huge vulnerabilities involved with that because if there was any hack that were to happen to the atomic clock that it connects to, like massive amount of systems everywhere would, would be affected. Okay, so how does Bitcoin avoid that? It doesn't have an internal clock yet it's telling time on its own. And that's what I want to talk about here. So on this graph, we have the two axes here. Over time, the hash rate has this trend of just sort of like up and down and up and down and up and down, but over time, just generally going up. What this is actually showing, it's, it's a rough estimation as to all the miners that are mining on the Bitcoin network. And this is what powers the Bitcoin watch, okay, the Bitcoin time chain. 
If total network hash power is low, that means there are relatively few miners doing the process called mining. All right, this also means that new blocks are produced more slowly. If total network hash power is high, that means there are relatively more miners mining. This also means that blocks are produced more quickly. The timing of blocks is regulated by what's called a feedback control loop. Uh, it, it's not a very complicated structure, but it's really quite useful when you see the function of it. So this is a generalized case for a feedback control loop. You have inputs, you have controls, you have an output, and you have a feedback sensor that basically measures if the output has been met and then changes, basically tells the controls to either continue or stop based on, uh, based on if that output has been met yet. Okay, so this is the same thing, but now using Bitcoin as a specific example, right? So this is the general case, this is the Bitcoin specific case. The input we have here is the total network hash rate or how many miners are mining doing this thing called proof of work. The control is what's called mining difficulty. So if you just imagine there's this thing called mining and we can either make it more difficult or we can make it slightly easier. The goal is not just to produce a block, but to produce a block in a fixed amount of time, 10 minutes. I can show you how this actually works in practice, right? So here's an even more specific example of what's going on. In 2004, we had 100 terahash per second of total network hash power. The difficulty then was this arbitrarily large number, 6.1 billion. You can look at a number from 2018, which is then four years later, and we'll see that the, the hash power, the network hash power going in as the input has increased and the difficulty has increased with it to keep blocks being produced in about 10 minutes. Right? Does that make sense? So it's it's creating this system creates stability in the in in this decentralized time chain. As new miners are are added to the system, the the time it takes to find the average block stays the same, and that's why the idea of a time chain is more telling and more significant than a blockchain. Okay, I hope that made sense. I hope you got something out of that. If you like this video. Give it a thumbs up, leave a comment in the comment section below, uh, and I'll see you in the next video in the playlist.